From the Toronto Star, I'm Adrian Chung, and this matters. Canadians are grappling with some hard questions right now. What does this country stand for? How was it built? Who paid the price? The calls to cancel Canada Day, to reframe and rethink how we market, is growing. Cities coast to coast to coast, from Victoria to Whitehorse to Fredericton, have canceled July 1st festivities. This is a moment of reckoning in Canada, of its colonialism, of generations of genocide towards Indigenous peoples and communities, a fight over Canada's perceived ideals and the truth of its history. The only crime we ever committed as children was being born Indigenous. Genocide on our treaty land. We will find more bodies and we will not stop until we find all of our children. Should we be celebrating while more than a thousand bodies and counting of Indigenous children are being found in unmarked graves at former residential school sites? On This Matters, a two-part episode. We'll talk to Samantha Krishna Pillay, the founder of the On Canada Project, about the work that non-Indigenous allies should be doing and thinking about this year. But first, we hear from Ontario MPP Sol Mamakwa, official opposition critic on Indigenous and treaty relations, who says this is not a moment of celebration, but rather, he says, one of mourning, reflection, and education. Sol, thank you for joining. I appreciate your time to talk. Thank you for having me here, Adrian. This is a year of reckoning as many Canadians are facing up to the colonial history of this country, learning the truth of how Indigenous peoples are treated, especially this summer, but maybe every summer of your life. What does Canada Day mean to you? Canada Day is a very colonial day. It's based upon a celebration of how Canada was built upon from an Indigenous perspective. And I think this coming Canada Day is going to be especially hard. Hard in a sense where, you know, over the last month or so, we've found remains of Indigenous children that were found that went to residential school. And a lot of us, Indigenous people across the country, cried. A lot of us, you know, shed tears. And, you know, Indigenous people are hurting. You know, the unspeakable horror, the unspeakable truth that is coming out. And I think that's why it's a bit different this year when we talk about, you know, when right now Canada, Canadians, you know, are finally waking up to the price that it was paid to establish, you know, this country that we live in today. There is this discussion about, well, what does celebration look like? Should we be celebrating? Is it acceptable knowing Again, the colonial history of this country, many non-Indigenous people are learning it for the first time because it wasn't taught in schools. So to mark this day, what should Canada Day be for, you think? Canada Day this year should be a day of mourning because of what we've found in these former residential school sites. Canada Day should be a day of reflection, you know, as a Canadian on how racism, how colonialism, oppression works in this country we call Canada. And I think it's really important that it not be a day of picnics. It's not a day of, you know, parties. It's not a day of fireworks. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that. And, you know, that's what I ask people to reflect on that, to think about that. And certainly not everyone will, you know, listen, but that's okay. The worst thing that you can say if you ask for something is a no. And it's so important. It's ingrained in our teachings. It's ingrained in our way of life where, you know, if there's a tragic event that happens in our communities or a neighboring community, we stop and reflect. We stop and mourn with our brothers and sisters. And that's just the way we are. And that's the way it should be. And I'm not saying cancel Canada Day. I'm not saying cancel, you know, fireworks, but perhaps delay it. And I think that's so important. I think that's kind of the messaging I had. And then my message wasn't about to cancel it, but it's a day to reflect. It's a day to mourn. We're all about moving forward. We're move about, you know, accepting the truth that has happened in this country. And it's about the time to reflect about, you know, the dark history, the real history, our shared history of Canada. 
and commit to doing better. Commit to doing, you know, better now, but also better in the future. And you know, we have to do this for all our children in Canada. Again, at the end of the day, we want a better community. We want a better Ontario. We want a better Canada. And we want a better society at the end. Saul, do you see the conversation shifting in a meaningful way about Indigenous rights and Indigenous solidarity in this country? Do you think that we are advancing in that way? Advancement will not happen overnight. And I think it changes the conversation. It changes the trajectory of thinking of the people in Canada, you know, of the real history, acknowledging the real history of what happened to Indigenous people for generations and generations. When we talk about oppression, when we talk about colonialism, and when we talk about, you know, the racism, not only that, like I can go on further as, you know, the genocide, the crime against humanity that has happened over hundreds of years. And we can no longer look away on this issue in itself, you know, the Indigenous history, the Canadian history. And then I think, again, you know, I'm hopeful, but in a sense, like, you know, we just don't want to be a new cycle as well. We don't want to be used as a political thing as well in order to make change. We need to be able to see the fundamental changes that are needed in this country. Like as an example is putting resources, significant resources, to the 94 calls to action from the TRC. And I hear a lot of good stuff from politicians, federally, provincially, from all over. And, you know, those good words, like I see very well-crafted statements, but they do not mean anything anymore. And that's why I say that we need to put resources into the TRC calls to action so they can be implemented in the proper way. I saw a tweet from Indigenous comedian Ryan McMahon that I thought was very poignant. He said that cancelling fireworks in a celebration is low-hanging fruit. But he said that a true measure of whether Canada is listening or not is what happens next year, Canada Day 2022. Is that a good measure to you, to know that this conversation is not just this summer, it is from here on out that it continues on. It will be a good measure. I say that because the coming years, we're going to be searching sites. We're going to be searching former residential school sites, burial grounds. And this work, the next few years will be very difficult for Indigenous people. And not only that, for Canadians as well, because the findings will come on repeat, repeat repeat. And we have to have those discussions as well when we have to start talking about exhuming, examining remains. We have to start talking about identification. We have to start talking about repatriation. And so that's why those documents, archives are so important in identifying the remains that we will continue to find not only that, what do we do with the management of unidentified remains? So I see this work happening for the next you know, decade or so. And I think that's why I would agree with that comment. Sol, thank you so much for your time and your energy to share this with us. Thank you for having me here, Adrian. Miigwech. That is Ontario MPP Sol Mamakwa. We'll be right back. Coming up next, Samantha Krishnapalai. She's the founder of the On Canada Project, a volunteer group made up of millennials and Gen Z on how to create change through conversation. We'll talk about the work that non-Indigenous allies should take on now. Hi, Samantha. Nice to talk to you. Thanks for your time. Thanks so much for having me. As a non-Indigenous person, how do you think your relationship with Canada Day has changed? Do you see it differently now? Or how do you think we should mark this day differently compared to the past? Yeah, I think if I'm being totally honest, I normally celebrate Canada Day. And I don't think I've been really a great ally to the Indigenous people of this land in the past, even though I was somewhat informed, not as much as I am now. But I think with the news from Kamloops and the 215 children whose remains were found behind you know, a school that they were forced to go to that was designed to do just that. 
it really changed how I engaged with the day. And I think it's quite complicated because many of us have such strong feelings of like gratitude to Canada for being a country that, you know, our families were given a different sort of life here. And there's like a lot of gratitude from that. And then we come from countries that were colonized that, you know, we have our own trauma from that experience. And it's obviously a very complicated issue. But when you really get into the information that's out there around this, I think it really simplifies very quickly around you can't celebrate a day when your country's in a period of mourning. With the On Canada project, you put out an Instagram post that has been pretty widely shared. And for listeners who may not be familiar, it's a post that essentially has ideas on how to turn this moment of mourning, you know, of the truth of the residential school system, of Indigenous children being found at these sites this summer, and how to turn that moment into action. And as somebody who is non-Indigenous and you're speaking from that lens... This post is also specifically aimed at non-Indigenous people. Why did you decide to go that route of speaking to people, meeting them where they're at in trying to have that conversation? Well, I think in general, we need to change the way we communicate with different generations in this country. But putting that aside for a second, with regards to, you know, I knew that we had to engage non-Indigenous people in this conversation because too often it's very much like this is an Indigenous issue and that's for the government and Indigenous people to figure out. And then as a non-Indigenous person, you're able to sort of take a step back and be like, I know this is really bad. I know they deserve support, but there's really not much I can do because I'm just a person. So you take a step back and kind of become sort of like a passive ally where you wish well for a community, but you're not really doing anything about it. And I think after what happened with Kamloops, I think I was like frustrated myself that I was like, I need to take action and I don't know what to do. So we dug into some research, we connected with Indigenous community members, and we came up with our initial first four steps, which are now seven steps of how you can exist in solidarity with Indigenous communities and how it is very much an issue we should all be talking about in this country that we should all be engaging in while centering the Indigenous experience. So it's not really our moment, it's someone else's moment, but we have to show up and pay attention to see any progress. And the easiest example I've been giving people for that is it took several days for a performative action of lowering the flags to occur. And that only happened because non-Indigenous people were outraged. Like settler outrage is what caused those flags to be lowered. Otherwise, I don't think they would have been. And if that's how long it takes for an action that doesn't require a lot, there's no money that goes into that. There's no time that really has to go into that. It's just a very easy checkmark action. How long will it take for the 94 calls to action? How long will there be true justice for Indigenous people of this land? And that's really what made me feel like we're not going to get the movement from our government unless we as citizens show that we're all in on this. Mm -hmm. And you talk about settlers being involved in this as well in taking action. What are some of those seven steps that people can use that are tangible that they can use in this moment to be an ally? Yeah. So the first part that is important to preface is that these are the first of many steps that as an individual you have to engage in. You can't recycle one day and say you're a climate activist. This is an ongoing journey. And truthfully, we're, none of us are going to be perfect at it the first time around. It will take an ongoing commitment. But the first seven steps that we sort of outline is to learn about the land that you live on through native-land.ca. And that gives you the traditional territories and the communities. And what's so cool about this website is it actually gives you the unique community websites and First Nation bands and communities that you can click and learn more about. And that's the second step is to do research about your local communities, not only the current issues they face, but what makes them unique? What's this vibrant culture and community behind it? There's a holistic way of learning about it. And we encourage people to do that. And it's so easy when you go to native-land.ca to do that. The third step is to read the Truth and Reconciliation Report. And when you're reading through it, center the three actors as like Indigenous communities and the people that are centered in the story, what the government and like existing structures have to do, but also what can you do to enact those? And it's going to look differently for all of us. We all have varying degrees of privilege and won't be super easy, but find the ones that you think you can mobilize around. And there are quite a few. Step four is to make sure that your elected representatives who too often do not take action on this issue, pay attention. So tweet at them, call them, 
I scheduled some emails on Google so that I don't have to do it every single day, but I scheduled it for like at the beginning of every week for a month so that they would continue to get an email from me being like, this is still a priority for me. This is still a priority for me. This is still a priority for me because too often these moments happen and they don't become a movement and we need it to continue to see actual change. We can't just let them get off the hook. Like elected officials just move on from it. I try to approach it with compassion. Like I'm mad at the structures and systems, not people. So how do we work together to look critically at our structures and be like, how do we change that? I've heard from many Indigenous leaders that they believe that this is a moment, not just of reckoning, but also a chance for people to have real conversations of education, like you were saying, even in a one-to-one situation about people learning about what really happened to people in the residential school system, to Indigenous communities for centuries now. And I wonder, again, when it comes back to being somebody who's non-Indigenous, Do you see these sorts of steps as an education of sorts when you have these conversations? Absolutely. Like I said, I haven't always been the greatest ally to this community either. And so I'm learning as I'm going along with that. And I think our account is learning and our team is learning. We're just trying to do that with as many people as possible. And I'm noticing people are having these conversations and it's necessary to keep having it. My biggest fear, like we can't change the past. We can't go back in time and undo what has been done. But if we know what we know now, in this moment, for the first time, I would say, in Canadian history, we had a collective moment of awareness in this way. If we go back to normal, what does it say about us? And that's what I want people to sit with. Is that the Canada you want to be part of? Because I love this country, but I want it to be better than what it was. And I know what it did in the past was wrong. I can't change that, but I am the future. We are the future, like especially millennials and Gen Z. So how are you going to be better than the past? And I know that feels overwhelming because it's like, what can one person do? But truthfully, if we all engage in this, we can be better than the former non-Indigenous people of the past. We can be better. We can take action. We can show true solidarity to a community that has been marginalized in every way, whose history hasn't been taught to us. Like, I mean, like there's so much here to unpack and who to this day, this is not a historical issue. It's a present day issue, not just with intergenerational trauma, but, you know, the foster care system and its disproportionate amount of Indigenous people in that is sort of like a repackaging of residential schools. It's just sort of branded differently and done a little differently, but it doesn't make sense that it's set up that way. And we need to take action around this. We need to be critical of this because otherwise we're just as bad as the past, if not worse, because we know better and we're not doing better. Samantha, thank you so much for your time and for talking to us about this. Absolutely. Thank you for creating space for this discussion. And that's Samantha Krishna Play. If you or anyone you know is experiencing pain, trauma, and emotional distress from residential school experiences, the Indian Residential Schools Crisis Line is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You can call for support at 1-866-925-4419. That's 1-866-925-4419. That's it for today. Thanks for listening. This Matters is hosted and produced by me, Adrian Chung, Saba Aitazaz, and Raju Muthar. Produced and mixed by Sean Patton, and our director of programming is JP Fozo. Our show theme music is by So Called, and our episode music is by Mike DeAngelis. We want to hear what stories matter to you. Please send us comments, questions, or ideas to thismatters at thestar.ca. Please consider supporting the journalism the Toronto Star Newsroom does at thestar.com. And don't forget to subscribe to This Matters on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Let's talk soon.